Okay, we started recording. Starting recording. Morgan is recording the call. Okay, we did it. Woo. Okay, Woo. the video didn't freeze. All right, here we are. So, okay. Jeremy. So, what magazine do you work with? So, I'm working with Bicycling Magazine for this article, and I work with a bunch of magazines and the outdoor and adventure travel industries. So I've been working mostly in outdoor industry news for the past couple of years since the pandemic slowed down travel for me. But okay. Now this article is going to be. It has been my goal when, whenever I've done um, interviews like this to get a, um, a writer such as yourself to like, do go on an adventure with me and write like a feature story for a, a journal type publication or something. I would love to do that. That's like my favorite way of working on stories, something that's more in depth, um, going and joining a subject and interviewee and watching their experience in the field and doing interviews along the way. I'm working on a bikepacking story right now about a trip I did in Navajo Nation in the spring. I can't share too much details about that because the story hasn't been published yet. But um, just really, really gratifying to go on the ground. And, you know, less and less journalists are able to do that just because yep. of budgets. Yep. Yeah. I'm but really if you get it do. sponsored, um, yep. which I could potentially have the capacity for, um, that would be the way to do it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think like not focusing on just the traditional forms of, of funding, but looking for sponsorship for journalists is such a great, great way to go. And media creatives so that we can actually get those stories told. So yeah, that's that's awesome. We gotta talk more about it. All right, very cool. I'm putting do not disturb on my computer for us. Um, okay, and then what magazine is this story for? So this story is for Bicycling Magazine. It'll go online. And it should be published in the next month. Uh, I don't have the exact published date, but I expect to go. I expect it to go up pretty soon. And um, as I told you um, in my outreach, it's a story that's sharing with our very broad audience and readership. So people of all experience levels, how to become and how to support a paraplegic hand cyclist off road and on the pavement. So I have a couple of other interviews I'm gonna talk with about the types of bikes that you can buy, the types of hand cycles that you can buy, as well as how to make a plan to go hand cycling on pavement. And I wanted to talk with you about, um, as an expert on off road travel, how do you plan a day to go out and cycle on the trails. What are the types of obstacles that you should try to um, be aware of before you go? What What are the types of risks you should be aware of and how to just plan around those? So how can you do that as a hand cyclist? What kind of partners do you need? And then also we want to educate other bystanders, the bikers that are gonna, going to be in your periphery, how can those bikers support you? Um, who may not have experience with, with hand cyclists? Do they need to stop and get off the trail, for example? So those are types of questions we want to run through today. So again, this audience is across the U.S. and world, um, and some of the people maybe are just getting introduced to hand cycling. Maybe someone they know is becoming a hand cyclist, or maybe it's a road a road biker, a road hand cyclist who wants to get on trails and they don't know how to do that. Got you. Got you. Very um, cool. Very cool. This is definitely a different um, angle. I, you know, usually people are asking about trails and um, 
adaptive friendliness of trails. So this is a com completely, completely different topic. Very, very cool. Awesome. And that will also be folded into my questions. It's actually like one of the first questions I have for you. If you're ready, we can dive into those. I was born ready, kid. Let's do it. All right. Okay. <laughs> so what types of off-road trails would you recommend for a beginner adaptive rider? For example, beginner. what features should they look for with difficulty rating, which we'll get into I'm sure. Um, ascent and descent, the parking area and access, like what, what are the ingredients that a beginner adaptive rider should really look for before they get out there? Great question. Um, the answer to that is very tough, actually, because of the word beginner. Um, and when that applies to um, the adaptive rider, because <clears throat> Um, the gamut of equipment is so broad and the gamut of uh, rider disability and ability is so broad. Um, for example, there could be a rider who has been riding for a long time, who is an expert rider um, relatively, um, but what they can are capable of riding is a lot less than a beginner rider because maybe the advanced rider, uh, you know, has a higher disability or maybe less capable equipment. Whereas you might get a beginner rider riding for their first time and maybe it's some hot shit, young, low level paraplegic on a bowhead, which is very capable equipment. And then even though that rider is a beginner, they could ride a lot more than what the advanced rider is capable of. So that's why this this question is is really difficult because it's so it's so organic and based on the formula of rider disability, rider capability and equipment capability as well. So what I recommend is number 1, the blanket rule, you know, don't go alone the first times. Um I have just learned the hard way when you know, I just I always do everything on my own um, and uh, I don't like to like calling and texting friends. Hey, can you go with me? Can you go with me? It's, it's just, it's just another layer to add to just, you know, trying to get out on the trail late in the day, you know, just trying to get out there. <clears throat> um, and I just, I learned the hard way. Um, because there's so much uh, involved with the equipment. And uh, when, I, I, when I forgot my first adapted bike, I was an inexperienced bike rider. And so maintenance of the equipment and how to take care of it, how to shift properly, um, how to check the weather first. <laughs> I got, totally got yeah. caught in a flash flood situation. It was gnarly. <laughs> um yeah i was i was i was riding i didn't check the well i was riding by myself in my home canyon in san diego and i did not check the weather before going riding it was kind of like i was having a bad day i was all in my head i was all I was frustrated i was like i just gotta get out and it took forever and i finally got out there um and it starts sprinkling i'm like okay whatever no worries and it turned into a major downpour like pretty much right when I started riding, like crazy timing. And I end up, at that time I had an external drivetrain so I can get like kind of stuck in too big of a gear. Now I have a, an internal drive hub and I can't get stuck in too big of a gear. I can shift it even if, when I'm stopped and it's in that gear no matter what. So anyways, I'm stuck in too big of a gear. I break my chain, I'm in this creek you know, it's only a few inches deep, but I got to get out of the bike to fix the chain. So I'm, I'm sitting in this creek, you know, and you're fixing my chain. And all of a sudden I hear this water break loose. And instantly I'm in like neck deep water. My bike is completely submerged. <laughs> it was so gnarly. And then what I had to do 
Like, imagine being a paraplegic, <laughs> sitting, you know, and lifting my bike up onto this bank. Like, it was only like three feet, but I can't like stand up and lift it, you know, getting my bike up on this bank and oh my God. It, and then I finally got out. I got my chain fixed. And then it, I had to stop like every like 10 minutes to clear the drivetrain of all the clay mud <laughs> and had to have my girlfriend at the time like come and rescue me <laughs> it was so gnarly anyways that story wow. to explain that uh these types of things that you just don't think of you know as a beginner writer you know what tools to carry how to be prepared how to take care of your equipment and all the things that are necessary just as a begin if you're a beginner writer just don't go alone and therefore, what a beginner rider, what, well, what any adaptive rider can ride with someone is very different than what um, an adaptive rider can ride without somebody. It's, it's a, it's, you can ride, a adaptive rider with support can ride so much more than without. Um, and so my advice is just to stick to, if you're by yourself, you're a beginner rider, especially if you're in an area that you're not familiar with. If you're a beginner rider, you're not familiar with the area anyways because you haven't ridden your beginner rider. Just stick to the fire roads, basically, um, is what I advise. Um, that's what I've learned, and I've still gotten trouble on fire roads. Man, I was riding uh, in the Cuyamac area in the, in the mountains east of San Diego, and uh, it was October, early winter. There was actually snow on the ground. There was a felled tree. So, you know, how, how are you dealing with a felled tree <laughs> is a, is a whole other thing. And that was on a fire road. And then you, you get into gates and things like that. But for the most part, usually you're good to go on fire roads. You're not going to experience the best an area has to offer, but most likely going to get home safely, you know, <laughs> and that's a lot better you, than not. Yeah. How did you handle the fell tree in that situation? I was able to get under it. Um, it was a, it, it was, wasn't like perfectly easy because there's branches and I had to kind of lift it with one hand as I like crank through underneath it. And it was a little interesting. <clears throat> and then I did come across some mountain lion tracks right after that. So that was a little freaky. <laughs> you're gonna scare all of our listeners to never go biking on off pavement really i feel like those <laughs> stories are exciting <laughs> <laughs> well yeah if, uh, are scared, i like I your sense that, of adventure i i think that's a healthy fear if those stories scare you um because that will mm -hmm. scare you into being prepared and doing the safe making the safe choices. I am tired of gambling with my equipment and my body um, and just my day too, because uh, just a normal ride can turn into a really shitty day really quickly. Um, just, you know, imagine turning, uh, get being a paraplegic and getting out of the bike on like narrow single track and trying to turn it around when there's like a drop off that itself is a very like strenuous endeavor, maybe not dangerous, mm -hmm. but not the most fun and not the kind of situation I want to get myself into anymore. And I don't want to break my bike anymore. I don't want to break my body anymore. So I'm, what I'm saying is I'm tired of gambling. So, so go with a partner. Go with Don't a, gamble. Go with a partner. Yeah. Um, you know, I've passed that trail that I've been like wanting to explore when I'm by myself. And it's the, that decision. Do I go down it or don't I? I've gone down that trail plenty of times um, in my experience. And most of the time it works out. Um, but sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't. And that's where the gamble happens. And so just don't mm -hmm. gamble because when it doesn't go right, it just freaking sucks yeah and so getting back to this 
this terminology, the beginner adapter writer and that scale of experience level, is it a disservice to use that? I mean, it definitely sounds like a disservice to use that in isolation without these considering these other variables of the spectrum of ability and the spectrum of equipment that this person could be on. So as far as like educating readers, um, should we just say, this is what we recommend for adaptive writers. Hey, you're gonna have a spectrum of experience level alongside your ability differences and equipment differences. Is that a better way to, to frame? this conversation, in addition to the also the trail difficulty scale that you're creating. Yeah. But they might have access to that where they live. Um, I think what you're getting at is there, there's a, a misconception out there that there is one type of adaptive trail. Uh, that Well, that is the major misconception. And that is completely untrue. Watch my videos um, and you'll see. Um, and there tends to, there's this like tend towards oh building adaptive trails, um, adaptive specific trails. And for me, what I hear right there is segregation. And I don't want to be segregated. I don't want to be you know relegated to um, a separate trail than everybody else. I want to ride what everybody else is riding. Um, now we never want to change the nature of a trail if it's just not if it's environmental impact is just too great or if it's just um, too much work and too many changes to make a trail adapter friendly, then no, the, 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 I'm not, you know, I'm not going to ride that trail, but if it only takes a, you know, what usually it is, is, you know, just a, a change here or there. And to me, that's a no brainer. If you can just make a couple changes to a trail, to get a whole other user group through no brainer that's that's called in inclusivity um and of course never want to dumb down a trail but when it comes to uh you know labels of riders um i i, I feel like a rider should the rider themselves should know where they fall in the spectrum um and make decisions accordingly um, you know, I wish everybody uh, did trail research before they went out, but that that's rarely the case. Only like geeks like me, maybe you, do you do trail research before you go out? Before you're Absolutely. at? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, I so cool. mostly, I have to, I mean, where I live, I live in Crested Butte, Colorado. And so a lot of the trails, you just go a couple miles away from town and you're in a really remote place. So, yep. and a lot of the trails here are, are very challenging. So as a, um, you know, I've been here three years, so I'm still getting to know the trails and I definitely have to do research before. Do you know the guys that and run I, the adaptive program there? I... Um, I've Rob met and Mark. a few people who work on the program, but I don't know Rob and Mark, and I would love to meet them. That's funny. I just emailed Rob this morning. What a coincidence that you live there. That's, well, that's a coincidence for me. Um, so <laughs> yeah. when it comes to doing trail research, um, most people don't. Um, and okay. if they do, what they're going to do is, um, you know, look for recommended routes on trail forks. Um, and two, type the name of the trail into YouTube and watch videos. So that's kind of where my focus has been is providing that information to serve the majority. Cause that's, if someone's going to do trail research, that's what they're going to do. Um, my hope is that, uh, adaptive riders will, will do that. And, I don't want to say in the near future, but in the future, the information for adaptive riders is going to be documented. Um, that's our whole work. And um, Trail Forks has adopted my rating system, and we're in this for the long game. We're talking big data here. So over time, um, as our group of trail document tours 
um, ambassadors. I'm in the process of training ambassadors to do the same thing I'm doing in their respective areas. So every every ride, every trail, you know, every trail, every ride, hopefully that information is inputted. And then over the course of the next decade or two, maybe even, you know, there'll be a lot of trails documented. And so an adaptive rider can just go on the trail forks app and uh, get the information. And that's coupled, okay. hopefully coupled yes. with, with video recommended routes and trail blogs that um, talk about facilities and things like that. Um, so all that to answer your question, the, the rider themselves should know where they're at in the spectrum, you know, and do their trail research. Um, but also take care of their freaking equipment. <laughs> because that's the, t you never want to be that person that's having, it hap whatever it happens, flats, mechanicals happen, but can be greatly minimized with just a little bit of maintenance, a little bit of TLC to your equipment, and especially this complicated equipment. Uh, adaptive mm -hmm. equipment you add the power assist you add multiple chains you know it's a lot can happen and you don't want to be that person where the ride is just cut short or just shitty because something's happening so my advice is take care of your equipment do trail research and know where you where you land in that spectrum mm -hmm. that's so Mm -hmm. In addition to trail forks and looking at the videos on YouTube that you're producing, are there any other resources for finding safe off-road trails that you'd recommend for a hand cyclist? Yeah, you know, there, there's there's other people out there doing the same stuff. Um, there's, there's other trail blogs. Um, and usually they're relative to the area that that particular person for example, like most of my my blogs are in the Southwest area, California, Arizona, Colorado, that that area, those areas. Um, I, I can't quote off the top of my head the other trail blogs, um, but there are there are others. And yes, I I, I do recommend checking them out because information is information, you know. Although we don't all agree on the method, we're still on the same team and providing information, you know. Yeah, information is always mm -hmm. good, but even with all this awesome information for everything in the middle, that's a maybe, you know, it's still, there's just still with all the information that could possibly be available, there's still a question. You don't know until you go, even with uncut video and things like that, you still don't know until you ride it. So okay. that's why I say always have a support rider. Um, the, the time to not have a support rider is if you know a trail is good, you've ridden it before and you know, it's good and you're familiar with the area then, or if you're sticking to fire roads, those would be the times where you could probably get away with not having a support rider, but the blanket rule, never explore new single track alone for the first time. Got it. It's, Great. It's a, it's a gamble. It's a gamble. Mm -hmm. yep. Why are you smiling? And what are your biggest? I just, I just <laughs> laugh because um, I'm just thinking about all of the scenarios I've been caught in personally, and it just makes me uh, laugh fondly at just the bonding experience of being with other riders, and you have a mechanical or someone crashes. Like the last big ride I did, I took a really big crash and it was nice to have my two riding partners there just for the moral support. We were so, we were like a mile from the truck. Uh, but it's you just, had a big it's, crash? it's good to, to not. Were you hurt? Yeah, I had a big crash. I did get hurt. Um, and that was the first time I'd been hurt playing outside in a while. So, um, yeah, I've been recovering for a couple months now, but I went over the handlebars and my elbow took the fall. And so I had a pretty bad abrasion. And then my shoulder was really stiff, but I went into my woofer certification the next day. 
And so I was really high on adrenaline, just studying and, you know, doing all the, uh, all the scenarios, lifting bodies, didn't realize my shoulder, my rotator cuff was strained. And so as soon as I finished the course, my adrenaline went down and I could actually feel the the pain. So I've been doing a lot of acupuncture to help with that and just trying to rest a lot before, uh, before winter season picks up. You're doing your like <laughs> external and internal, this stuff where you pull all the, and push, you do all stuff to strengthen your rotator cuff. Yeah, I'm back in the gym now, thankfully. So I've been I've been doing some strength training for the last couple of weeks. What's yeah. woofer training? Oh yeah, so a wilderness first responder course. Oh, cool. And it's, yeah, yeah. Do you do? Are you a firefighter in the summers? I'm not a firefighter. I so professionally, I I just do the writing, but uh, but I am really interested to get involved with search and rescue at some point. That's a volunteer service here, and there's a couple, there's a few teams in our area. Um, I would probably try to be involved with the Crested Butte one because I live in Crested Butte right now, so that would just make the most sense but really I just decided to get a woofer because I've been playing outside and in wilderness areas by and in the mountains for my entire life I was born and raised nearby I told you I I grew up in Telluride and outside of Durango in a little town called Bayfield and so split my time between my parents homes in those two locations and I've always been outside and been really lucky to this point that I haven't had if I haven't come across anything, any really difficult accidents, but I think it's going to happen at, at some point. Um, and I want to be able to know how to respond to help people if that ever happens, whether it's in my group or I come across another group or I, it ha- something happens to me, like I just wanted that, that knowledge base to, to actually help. Um, that's actually really cool and really important for our conversation, um, to have some type of emergency training as a support rider, um, is really good, is really good. Um, because you never know what's going to happen out there. And then also, you know, the higher someone's disability level is or whatever, you know, the more kind of stuff that can happen. And it's just good to be trained, you know, it's, it's just really good to be trained, um, and be prepared for stuff like that to happen. Yeah. And that's, that's actually one of the questions I wanted to ask you is how do you choose your support rider or your riding partners, your ride team? How do you, I mean, of course there's like the efficiency of getting out there that you mentioned earlier in our call where like you you want to get out you know and sometimes you sense this like uh I guess that eagerness to get out and so maybe you might be a little bit quick with choosing who you're going to go ride with like can this friend go um or you might end up going alone like you you mentioned but ideally what what kind of skills do you want or demeanor do you want your support rider to have for you to be a good ride partner? Uh, great question. Um, yeah, usually I ride with randoms. I ride with anybody that'll ride with me, you know, um, especially yeah. if I'm traveling, I'm, I'm in an area that I don't know. And I'm just like scrambling, like begging people to ride with me. You know, I am, I'm contacting the local trail association. I am contacting everybody I know in the area. I'm on social media, Hey, will somebody ride with me? And you'd be surprised at how hard it is. <laughs> it's it's kind of it's kind of crazy, you know. Sometimes I like have an entourage. I'll get like overwhelming response, and then sometimes it's like I'm just like <laughs> pulling teeth to trying to find somebody to ride with me. So in that case, I dude, I ride with randoms um, all the time, and I'm not picky. Um, if someone's got you know two working legs and two working arms and can kind of ride a bike let's go you know (laughs) um but the question ideally um who is man i and i i think i 
when I think about that question, I think about um, my my friends that I ride with. Um, I've got my my boy in Mammoth, one of my my besties, Foxy. What's up, buddy? Uh, my boy Foxy in Mammoth. This guy is one of those guys that's good at everything. Total jerk. Like he can do anything, and he's good at it. I did take him surfing, and <laughs> he had a little bit of a hard time. So, got you, buddy. <laughs> um, but he is a ripping rider. Um, he's a firefighter. He's ski patroller. Um, that's the kind of guy. That's the kind of person that I want with me. You know, someone who's super athletic and trained for emergency situations. And he's he's a little guy. He's a rock climber, but pound for pound, he's like the strongest guy I know. Like. He can pick me up and pick my bike up as if it's nothing. So that's the type of person that I want. Um, someone who's a ripping rider um, and someone who understands me, has experience with me, knows my, knows that formula for me, you know, and I can send him ahead to do some recon and assess the situation if we need to. And he'll come back like, oh, we got this or come back like, nope. And if he says turn around, boom, I don't even question it, you know, turn around. Um, and if we do get in the situation, I full trust that he's got it under control. That's the type of person I want with me. Someone who's um, very capable and strong and trained and understands me. Mm. Yeah. Um and it sounds like it also just takes time to build that relationship and build that understanding of each other. Uh, it, does. On the it does take time. I mean, to understand that formula of someone, that, that equation that we discussed of rider capability, rider disability and equipment capability, to understand that does, I mean, does take exposure and experience with someone. So to answer the question, ideally, someone who knows me. Yeah, someone who's had that experience with me. All right. And then can you give us a little more insight about those types of situations, situations that you might get into where you're going to need help and support from a partner? Yep. Uh, God, I mean, there's so many different things that can happen. Um, just a simple mechanical. Um, you know, that's another qualification I would add on for someone who's an ideal support writer, someone who's mechanically inclined and understands the equipment. Um, I can get out onto the ground and fix my bike. I carry tons of tools with me. Um, but that, it's a lot easier if my boy can just reach under there and put the chain back on or whatever, you know, and I don't have to get out and go through the whole rigmarole. And also not everybody has that luxury of being able to get out of their bike and back in. Um, so having someone who's mechanically inclined, who can take care of mechanical situation on the trail, um, that's a, that's a situation, um, very, and very common, very, very common, but the other extreme, you know, when we're talking about a crash, spe specifically a rollover where you end up off the trail, this is where things get interesting because, um, not only do you have to pull the person back up to the trail and we're talking, you know, if someone's paralyzed, we're talking, you know, carrying dead weight and also someone who has limited capability to get themselves up, you know, and then also you got to get the equipment back up um, and then get the person back in the equipment and then fix the equipment or you know, get it running again. If something happened, um, these are the types of situations where it gets interesting. Um, if I'm on a ride where I know that this is a high possibility, um, I do carry a harness and webbing with me. Um, I've just learned the hard way that um, being able, especially if I'm only with one support rider, um, if I can get a harness on and they can have something to pull me, it's a lot better than trying to push dead weight up a slippery slope. Uh, they can't get footing, you know, it's, it's not, it's not an easy situation. And then you can turn around and use that, that webbing for getting the equipment up as well. And so it, 
when you said um, you'll carry that harness and webbing on trails where it's likely that this type of situation would happen, a rollover, do you, uh, how are you making that prediction? Is it based off of how rocky the terrain is, or maybe you know that it's going to be uneven, or is it that it's steep? Can you give a little more details on? Yes. Uh, so, um, well, single track that would cause. That. Um, sorry if I was talking over you right there. Um, it was cut. It was cutting out. I didn't realize you were still talking. Um, well, a trail with a lot of um, exposure, um, and especially exposed off camber. Um, but the the formula that I use, you know, this bike is also how I hike. It's it's how I get out on the trail and have a relationship with nature. So if I'm on a trail or some type of adventure where it's kind of more mountaineering than mountain biking, where I've got at least a couple people with me um, ejecting from the equipment is probably going to happen at some point. And we're basically mountaineering. We're getting from point A to B. We're not necessarily mountain biking per se, technically. So in that type of situation um, is where I'm going to carry uh, safety equipment like that. If I'm just out for a ride for a day, I'm not going to carry stuff like that. Does that make sense? So. Yeah, well, when you say mountaineering, is that like, um, like, are you traveling by bike on not on set routes? Like you've created the route. Is that what mountaineering is in, in the way that you're in the context you're applying it? Well, um, I use that term um, because for a, specifically for adaptive riding, it it's not necessarily mountaineering for um, a, a two-wheeled able body rider, um, but in the adaptive case, it is. In my mind, in just just logically, because it involves a crew, it involves equipment, you know, it involves ejecting from the bike, um, and in my estimation, it's I'm more hiking. I'm on an expedition rather than out for a ride. Does that make sense? Yeah, it it does make sense. It might be a yeah. normal mountain and bike route for you, but for me, because of what's involved, I mean, in my, I guess it's my opinion that it's just, that's kind of where it crosses the line from mountain biking to mountaineering. Okay. Um, and then do you have any tips for, adaptive riders on how to balance and paddle and uneven terrain, um, how to, to take those difficult parts of the trail, like a, a bank turn or rock gardens, any oh tips God. on tech? Yeah, everybody, everybody is, everybody. So the answer to that question is so organic. Um, they're, uh, okay. everybody's so different and the, and every and terrain is so different and every situation is so different. Um, my advice uh, over a blanket rule over all of that is if there's a question, get a spot, you know, just play it safe, avoid drama, don't gamble, get a spot. Um, even if it looks like nothing, I, I post my videos and I get a spot. People are like, why do you need a spot right there? I'm like, dude, <laughs> I'm sick again. I'm sick of gambling. You know, I'm sick of gambling. Um, that's my, that's, that's, that's the one tip that I would say. Great, great tip. Um, and then I wanted to actually step back and do a follow-up question on um, something that you mentioned a few minutes ago, which was that not everyone has the luxury of getting out of their bike and back in. Can you share with us a little more about that? Is that to do with upper body strength or are you talking about a quadriplegic rider or does that have to do with the type of bike that you're on? Both, both. Um, okay. You know, the difference between a paraplegic and quadriplegic, most people know is this right here. 
this is independence. This is something for me to be very thankful for. Um, and I have a lot of friends that don't have that. Um, and are unable to get physically out of their bike and back in again. Um, but also, yeah, the types of bikes. There's um, different bikes that are a lot harder to get in and out of as well. So the answer to your qu question is both. Um, physical um, ability, upper body strength, and also the type of equipment. Definitely make it, can make it more difficult. But man, I have quadriplegic friends that do it. Can you imagine <laughs> that get out of their bike and fix it? Oh my God. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, yeah, it is very incredible. I, yeah, I've, I've never spoken with a quadriplegic person or met anyone or ridden with anyone. So I just, I just can't imagine. Um, but I, I, that's really interesting to hear, um, you like you've ridden with uh you have quadriplegic riding partners mm -hmm. so you're able to support them too and see see what that experience is like yeah absolutely um um yeah riding with uh someone who's quadriplegic is a is a is a really crazy experience um uh and seeing my my friends and what what they're capable of and is is very inspiring um but also it's a testament to the equipment quadriplegic can go ride and jump off rocks now and it's freaking awesome yeah yeah mm -hmm. that is awesome um that's really sweet but it's it's certain types of bikes right like not all bikes are outfitted or built to support quadriplegic riders correct correct um okay. of course everybody's different and what they need but um you know I'm, I'm the u.s dealer for a brand that's the bikes that i ride that are built in poland um, and we have a bike with a quadriplegic setup and what that entails is super cool um, they have an elbow shifter and an elbow brake, which, you know, because wow. most quadriplegics have some use of their upper body, just not full. And um, it has uh, handles where their hands are strapped to the crank and they shift with their and brake with their freaking elbow. It's amazing. It's amazing. That's so cool. It's so cool. Remind me of the name of your company. That you're My company for? is called um, JPM Pro, um, and I'm the U.S. dealer for Sport On, okay. which are off-road hand cycles built in Poland. Okay, that's so cool. Um, awesome. And then, let's see. So. I'm just looking ahead at my questions because we popped around very yep, yep. organically. Um, what's the most supportive language that a support writer can use or a writer that passes you on the trail? Oh. Is there ever a specific etiquette or just um, something that you prefer to hear or that the public should be aware of is inappropriate to say? got another really great and really difficult question <laughs> um man i always say that i would i would hate to be you because <laughs> what to do when an encountering uh you know someone in a wheelchair or an adaptive rider is different to each person <laughs> and to know what to do is is pretty much impossible and it's really easily, you can very easily and most likely do the wrong thing from what that person prefers. For example, um, I don't need help, you know, just, you know, just not on the trail, just everyday life as a, you know, as a analogy metaphor. Um, I don't, I don't want anybody to, I don't need anybody to open the door for me, you know? Um, but, if 
you know, it's just polite. If you're someone's behind you, you open the door for them, whether they're in a wheelchair or not. So in that case, I'm like, of course, you know, um, now some people, um, are going to get mad. Don't open the door for me or whatever. Some people are going to get mad if you don't open the door for them. You didn't open the door for me, you know, (laughs) or it's to know what to do is impossible. I don't ever want to be in that situation. So folks out there, (laughs) good luck (laughs) knowing what to do because there's no way. Um, (laughs) And when it comes to encountering an adaptive rider on the trail, one normal etiquette as always, you know, don't be a Strava hole and say, hi, you know, (laughs) that's, that's the same thing with, with anybody passing anybody on the trail, no matter what user group, whether they're a mountain biker, hiker, equestrian, one wheeler, whatever, (laughs) um, or an adaptive rider, you say, hi, (laughs) that's just, that's just proper trail etiquette. Um, for me as an adaptive rider, sometimes, um, it's a lot harder to get to, to get off trail, to get to the side. Um, so I would say a default to getting out of the way for an adaptive rider. Um, whether it's uphill or downhill, uphill traffic has the right of way. But even if you do have the right of way, I would say get off trail, let the adaptive rider go by because it's probably a little more difficult for them to get off trail for you. Um, unless you have a big group or something. Um, I, I've, I've had large groups all get off the trail for me before. And I just feel so bad. Like there'll be like, 15 people all off the trail for me. And I, and I maybe have one person with me or by myself and I'm like, Oh God, no, 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 don't do that. Let me get off, you know? Um, and then also just normal trail etiquette for anyone. Let, let, let me know or let the adaptive rider know how many people are in your group. Hey, there's three more behind me. So we know, okay, cool. Um, and then uh, I always, if, if someone's, uh, you know, climbing past me or whatever, I'll let them know, hey, if you encounter anybody coming down, let them know there's an adaptive rider on the trail because although I hate this, <laughs> that I am obnoxious on a trail, but I am, I'm obnoxious on a trail. I'm, my bike is huge and I can imagine downhilling and then you come around the corner and you see this freaking huge thing. Oh, shit. <laughs> um, so my etiquette is I try to, you know, communicate, send the word up ahead, like, hey, there's a big weirdo on the trail. <laughs> um, when, but when it comes to the question of asking someone if they need help or not, that, that's the tough part. Um, and I would say assess, assess the person. If, um, look at their bike. If it's full suspension, if they look the part, maybe don't offer help. You know what I mean? By look the part, I mean if they look, you know, they're wearing gear that like, they look like they know what they're doing, you know? Odds are they do, um, so don't offer help, you know? Um, But if maybe, I don't know, um, they're... Look at, you know, is their helmet to the side? Do they have geek gap? You know, do they do they maybe look disheveled? You know, assess the situation. Um, and in that case, maybe offer, you know. Um, I, I, if someone offers and say, hey, man, let me know if you ever need anything. I'm like, fuck yeah, of course. Thank you, you know, because sometimes I do. And that's just the reality. But. Someone could get mad at that. That's what's crazy. You know, someone could get totally offended. Um, and someone could get offended if you don't offer that. So I say assess the situation, um, default to kindness, always. Th- those are kind of the two um, rules that you can apply to any situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so nuanced. And it's the so dynamics nuanced. are complicated and now we also have so many new bikers on the trails which is great it's absolutely fantastic so um, there's a me... learning curve with yep. with, uh, with learning etiquette 
even Absolutely. just the me, basic foundations that you're that you're pointing at here. So and let what me we're gonna reverse say that to etiquette for adaptive riders. Now, what I've encountered <laughs> with um, adaptive rider groups is they crank up the power on their power assist, and they are jamming on the trail, which is fine. Like to each his own. You know, it's not for me to tell someone how to ride. Um, but <laughs> my uh, advice to adaptive riders out there as far as it comes to etiquette is slow it down. Um, <laughs> I like to set my power assist to pace the analog riders that I'm riding with. So I'm going normal mountain bike speed. A lot of e-bikers e too. Now this isn't just adaptive riders, but e-bikers bump up the power and are going above normal mountain bike speed. Just, I mean, it's fun. I mean, it's so tempting to just moto and power. It feels so good. It's so tempting. Um, but for adaptive riders, you guys out there, just down, down your power. So you're going normal mountain bike speed. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> when I ride with other I, like, adaptive riders, I have to bump up the speed to keep up. I, and it, I don't like that. I don't like that. And then whoever's riding with us has to be on an e-bike. Uh, to me, the power assist, the purpose of it is an equalizer. To equalize <laughs> the playing field, to 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 bring it up to a level so you don't have to walk next to me. You know what I mean? When I'm on, on, on a climb. So that I can just be on I don't I'm not gonna hold up I'm not gonna hold up the pace. To me, that's the purpose of a e assist. Um, not to add this like extra moto level power, you know, experience. Mm -hmm. Is the e assist something that you can adjust while you're on the ride, just like yep. a shifter? Yes. On your and bike? I use okay. it as a shifter a little bit. Um, uh, my computer I have set to, there's um, nine different levels. Um, and I usually keep it between like three and four. Sometimes I got to bump up to five if I'm with like my pro rider friends. Um, <clears throat> and then I will bump it up to nine um, in a downhill situation so I can get speed coming into features and things like that. Hmm. Cause You're I'm in down full downhill. I'm in, I'm in downhill mode, you know, so I'm, um, I need to have both hands on the handlebar and I need to be able to like get speed into features and coming out of turns and berms like that. Since the turning radius is different, sometimes I'll have to brake and slow down. And so I'll need to gain, get that speed back. Um, but yes, so it is kind of like a whole other gear set for the crank set. I mean, that's basically nine gears for my crank set. So, mm -hmm. and yeah, you can, I'm constantly shifting with it. I'm constantly changing it depending on what's going on. Yes. Okay. And yeah. do, do all adaptive hand cycles come with that feature or do you have to add it on when you buy the bike? Well, not every adaptive bike has an e-assist. There's okay. analog adaptive bikes out there, which my first um, couple bikes were, and my joints are all blown out because of it. <laughs> so yeah, the answer is no, not every adaptive bike has that. Um, but if there is an e-assist, yes, every e-assist is um, programmable. And most of them are, you can have between, you can set it to have five settings or nine settings. Um, and then having a throttle or not is not, not every adaptive bike has a, has a throttle. Um, Which is super important. So it sounds like, hmm. yeah, tell me more. Well, about you said throttle, not every, is super, yeah. throttle is super important um, because sometimes I need both hands on the handlebar. You know, I can steer with one hand and crank with the other, but in a technical situation or a high speed situation, 
I, I cannot take my hands off the handlebar. And um, right. if I need that type of precision steering and stability and still need to propel, propel myself, that's where the throttle comes into play. The amount of terrain I can ride with a throttle is a lot greater than the amount of terrain I could ride without. Imagine going through technical rock gardens, you know, and having to take a hand off the handlebar. No way. And especially off camber where I need to lean, you know, definitely. That's totally. where the throttle comes into play. Um, and so can you tell me, I'm just curious to hear about, you said your first couple of bikes were analog adaptive bikes and now your joints are really feeling it. Um, why, I guess, is there a big cost difference or was there a specific purpose for getting an analog adaptive bike and not getting that e-assist from the beginning? Yeah, my ego. <laughs> I didn't, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a young, strong paraplegic. I don't, I'm not a quadriplegic. I don't need power you know this is kind of my my young where my young ego was at you know and uh, so i got fully analog bike i was super anti any type of power assist and i took that bike on awesome adventures moab sedona all kinds of stuff um but i mean my rides were like five to eight miles and uh if I rode eight miles, oh my God, I couldn't do anything for days afterwards. And wow. as I said earlier, on any climb, you might as well be walking next to me. And, you know, the amount of the type of terrain I could get through is really limited. You know, I had to get pushed a lot. Um, what I needed a support rider for was a lot more with a fully analog bike. Now, with a power assist, again level to just even the playing field not to like go moto around um it, it, it is a lot greater now my rides are 15 to 20 miles or more and i don't need as much support and my <laughs> my joints are not strained to the point of blowing out um and i can ride the next day you know? Yeah. So it was a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> a lot better. It just, it just, in the adaptive application, it just, it just makes sense. It's just, I, and as a dealer, I rarely sell an analog bike. Very, very rarely. I'd say 95% of the bikes I sell have a power assist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I'm just looking at my questions. We covered a couple of them in one. Well, when so... it comes to power assist, it's also important for a support rider um, when it comes to uh, the planning the ride uh, around uh, battery power and knowing what okay. uh, knowing knowing what the rider's range is as far as their power assist. Because if that battery dies and you don't have a spare, it fucking sucks it really sucks because for example my bike is geared for that power assist so to crank it analog and with all the extra weight the 12 extra pounds that the motor and the battery add like forget it i'm i'm i, I have to get pushed and it sucks to push somebody and hold your bike i've been in that situation too many times and i never want to do it again so i do carry a spare but understanding um, the range of the rider's um, power assist um, and have that conversation beforehand. Hey, what's your range like, you know? And then, you know, that is also very, very variable. I, my longest ride is 26 miles on one battery. And my shortest is six. That six miles was 4,000 4, <laughs> vertical and six miles. And oh and super steep and loose and just like the, the demand was so great. So, um, you know, looking at the terrain and you can have an idea of what the demand on the battery is going to be also, um, on wide stuff. Now the cool thing of engineering with my bike is that, um, I can steer with my chest when uh, my hands off the handlebar. 
Um, and when I'm cranking with two hands is when there's the least demand on the battery. So when I'm on wide stuff, fire roads, double track, I'm steering with my chest and cranking with two hands. And so knowing, uh, but when I'm on trail, I have to steer with one hand and crank with the other. And, mm -hmm. or if I need to use the throttle, you know, in those scenarios, there's a lot more demand on the battery. So the least demand is when I'm cranking with two hand, two arms. Um, and so understanding the terrain, like if you're going to be on all narrow trail, then there's going to be a greater demand on the battery. If you're doing a lot of fire roads, stuff like that, there's going to be less demand unless it's like super steep and loose, like the six mile ride that I did, which was fire road. I was cranking with two hands, but it was just so steep um, and a lot of spinning out and things like that. So taking a look at the terrain and getting an idea of what the demand on the battery is going to be like, understanding the range and having that conversation ahead of time is really important. And if, do they have a spare battery or not, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so helpful to hear the the demand, how it can deplete the battery in these different scenarios and Another example of how it's, it's going to take some time to get some experience, but you just have to have to grow from, you know, starting with a six mile ride that maybe only has 500 vertical and mm -hmm. see how the battery does and, yep. and then build from there. Yeah. And then also part of that equation of the demand on the battery is the, the rider disability level. Um, because uh, someone who's a, using an elbow shifter is probably going to shift less and use the motor to get up to speed. Um, okay. And so those, those, that's part of the assessment process when it comes to a demand on the battery and, and range. So if there's an elbow shifter, it sounds like that rider will most likely need the battery more often for the yes. speed. Is that yes. what you were? Okay. Yep. Because like, uh, you know, it's nothing for me to shift. And so for me to, to shift down to granny gear to get started is, is no effort. But for someone who's shifting with their elbow, perhaps with their hand or their hand strapped in is going to shifting is a little bit more uh, of a chore. And so they might not opt to shifting all the way down to granny gear when they're start, like starting from a stop and they'll use the motor to get up to speed of the gear they're in. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Rather than yeah. downshifting. And so that is demand on the battery. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, what kinds of, we've, we've talked a little bit about this, but what types of safety issues should hand cyclists be aware of and resources that they should use to help prevent emergencies or respond to an emergency? Get a spot. If anything is in question, get a spot. Because if you flip over, you know, equipment breakage is, 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 is likely and injury is likely. And if you don't have the luxury of being able to walk out, now that support, now it's all on that support rider to get you out of there. And uh, I've called 911 too many times and been helicoptered out before. It's, you don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, if, if anything's in question, get a spot. Um, the, the nemesis of these bikes, the thing to be aware of is ex off camber and especially exposed off camber. Okay. And don't be that person that doesn't take care of their equipment. Because it could be a simple breakage then, and you don't have this cause from non-maintenance and then you don't have the stuff to fix it on the trail well now you're in a situation because you can't walk you know so maintenance is all that more important and carrying um, tools is all that more important because um, if you break your bike boom you can just walk it back it might take a long time it might suck but you're fine you know i'm stuck 
I'm totally stuck. And I, all the, all the pressure is on whoever's with me or sometimes even on perfect stranger. I don't want to put someone in that situation. So when you talk about safety, preparation is super key. Uh, and that is maintenance, tools, trail research, don't ride a trail. <laughs> That's going to be a ton of work or where you can fall off a cliff, you know, <laughs> Unless that's what you know what you're getting into, you've got a prepared crew and equipment and you're prepared for it, you know? So preparation for when it comes mm -hmm. to safety. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, that covers all of uh, the questions that I had. Jeremy, is there anything that you'd like to add to the conversation? Um, man, we covered a lot. That's some cool stuff. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I mean, the difference between road and trail, it, you know, riding on the road is one thing, um, but riding on the trail is a whole other animal um, because you're, you're, you're getting further away from possible help, you know, and not having the luxury of being able to walk, it's it just it's a whole other level of thought and preparation and then you add like rocks and camber and dirt and it's just it's just a whole other mm -hmm. situation and so it's not and the weather taken. and the weather is that much i mean you can ride your road bike in the rain but you get on the trail in the rain and you're in an area like san diego where the it's like this mud this clay mud um and it's just super sticky oh it's gnarly um mm. it's just a, yep. it's just a whole other animal it's a whole other mindset so um not to be taken lightly mm -hmm. i have learned the hard way i took it lightly at first i didn't really understand these things and have had some very precarious situations on the trail how many years have you been an adaptive rider now i got my first adaptive bike in 2007 and I, I'm one of those people that just like takes a long time to learn anything. <laughs> uh, my learning curve is pretty long. Um, so it was quite a while of like just doing stupid, being stupid, doing stupid shit and um, learning the hard way. Situations like that flash flood thing where totally dumb, could be completely avoided, not not only should I've checked the weather, but uh, I was a very inefficient shifter. Um, and I, oh, breaking my chain could have totally been avoided. Mm. Also something that's hard to know when you're just getting into it. <laughs> yep, yep, e exactly, mm -hmm. yep. And yeah. that has been a progression over the, over the years since 2007. Uh, back then, the, the equipment has totally changed. Back then, it was um, either a bike with a drivetrain that could climb anything or a full suspension bike that was only gravity only. Mm. Um, and then these bikes that I, the company I work with now were the first to, to build a bike with both, both full suspension and a drivetrain. So the equipment has just come a, a really long way. It's pretty exciting to to watch. That is super exciting. Um, that's, yeah, it's awesome. I love that there's these tools that are just helping more and more people get out as, um, as their bodies change or their minds change yep. or they're just getting into the sport. Yeah. And assessing the equipment is, is important for uh, a support rider. Um, for example, looking if a person has front wheel drive or rear wheel drive, you know, if someone with front wheel, someone with front wheel drive, um, those bikes are typically a lot lower, so they're going to bottom out a lot easier, but also on anything steep or loose, they're going to need a push. Mm, okay. Um, as opposed to rear wheel drive and look at suspension. Do they have full suspension? Do they just have rear suspension? Um, that that's another uh, important thing to assess for equipment capability. Look at okay. and, and look at look at clearance as well. 
because these bikes are long. They can get high centered really easily. Okay. Um, I have so many questions about bikes for you, but I also want to respect your time. We've had a great conversation for the last hour and, um, yeah, I'd love to, to circle back and, and talk some more in the future. Oh, plan on it. Um, we're going to, we're going to work on a story. We're going to get an adventure sponsored and write a cool story about it. Let's do it. I would love that. Yeah, we can, I can come out to Bentonville or we can go and do a ride somewhere else. Absolutely. All the above. Um, for all my followers, um, what is your Instagram? Where do you want people to find you? Yeah, so people can follow my stories at Instagram is a good spot. I usually share the articles that I published there. And my Instagram handle is Mo Tilton. So M O T I L T O N. It's just my name, <laughs> Morgan Tilton. And listeners, watchers, um, her photos are freaking epic. Uh, I I couldn't help but to scroll through and wait. You have a so definitely check out her Instagram. Um, but you um, you have a trailer. You have a I... cool camping trailer it's not a taxa trail what what brand is it yeah so i had an opportunity to take out a trailer for a month earlier this year oh, okay. um and so it's, it's not yours you, okay yeah i test i did a gear testing write up so i took it out for it was maybe closer to six weeks um so i took it all over the southwest and did a road trip out to the west coast and it's oh, that trailer was really phenomenal. I wrote a couple of different reviews on it, so you can find out more about it. It's the um, Taxa Outdoors, is it the is company, a taxa. and then okay. the trailer model. Huh? I yeah. love how the, the whole, trailer model, the whole side mm -hmm. opens up. It's so cool. It was so cool. Yeah, I love that butterfly or like the the wing. It's called a wing door. Yep. And that was really unique. I didn't see that in any other trailers that size. And I actually haven't seen that design in any other trailer. Um, and so I absolutely love that because all of a sudden your small compact trailer becomes twice as big. Even if it's raining outside, as long as it's not raining sideways, you can yep. get protection from the wind and sit beneath it and get some fresh air in there and hang up your wetsuit to dry or hang up your other clothes and get shade. It was, it was just awesome. The model is called the Tiger Moth um, Overland. So it was the, the off-road version of the Tiger Moth. Oh, that's so cool. I, I've, uh, I've looked at those in depth. I'm super interested. Um, I, I recently acquired a van, uh, which is awesome. To me, the van is the the perfect, most comfortable scenario, but it's very expensive. And mm. um, I'm totally like exploring options like, oh, could I actually trade the Subaru in and get a Tacoma and sell the van, and yeah. which is very expensive. I'm not going to say how much um, and get a trailer, which is much less expensive, you know. Like, with, how would that work? You know, I would definitely have to make some compromises compared to van life. Because, um, like I said, the van is the ultimate. So I'm super interested in tra trailers like that. Like, something I could still fit yeah. my bike in, but I could still get in and out of, you know. That thing looks cool. Mm -hmm. It was so cool. Yeah, you should, if you want me to connect you with the company, to just talk about their designs and and maybe you can can go and poke around. They were really friendly. Um, it'd be sweet if you could check out their other trailers. I don't know if you'd want like the small model. I mean, that was the smallest one. So they do they do have larger trailers with like more robust kitchens. And, I've seen them. I've um, I've, ex I've explored their website yeah. in detail. Um, I have decided mm -hmm. to stick with the van. And the the reason being is the stupidest reason. Here's my main reason that I, I'd rather have this much more expensive thing for um, tailgating, uh, for tailgating 
at the beach and after rides and mm-hmm. thing, and and games. I like to go to professional sports games and tailgate. Um, I'm not going to pull a trailer to those things. I'm not going to pull a trailer to go yeah. ride for the day. I'm not, I can't pull a trailer to the like a crowded beach parking lot, you know. Um, so for those reasons, for drinking beer and grilling and tailgating after rides and stuff like that, I prefer the van is it. The van is it. Yeah. So it is. Yeah. Just gotta just gotta yeah. eat the cost, you know. Mhm. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, again, Jeremy, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. It sounds like, I mean, you've been out there riding for 15 years now, and we can all learn from your scenarios and your mechanicals and all the research and development you're doing with trail rating now. Um, Oh, man, we didn't, didn't ask you about your trail rating. I know there's plenty of articles on it. But before we hop off, do you want to just um, tell yeah, readers absolutely. a little bit more about the scale that you've developed yep. and what makes it unique and important for adaptive writers? I'm glad I'm glad you remembered because um, it's super important. Um, so Trail Forks um, asked me to come up with a simplified rating system that was duplicatable across multiple platforms, and um, I used what I think is logic, (laughs) Um, because like I said, there's other people out there doing this and um, they, they provide a bunch of awesome information. But when I go to their websites, I can't, I can't, my mind can't focus. There's too much information for me to narrow it down. And like I said earlier, when it comes to everything that's in the middle, everything that's a maybe there's no matter how much information is provided, there's still a question. Um, so the rating system doesn't reinvent the wheel. It, um, there's already all this, you know, information when it comes to like difficulty and topo profile and things like that already in every trail and from where information resource out there. All it does is answer the question that it needs to be answered. Do you need a support rider or not? That's it. Nothing about difficulty, nothing about that. All the information is already there. Now, adaptive writers know that like green, blue, black, whatever, sometimes needs to be shifted for adaptive writers. And most adaptive writers know this. Um, So when it comes to looking at like trails that have a bunch of switchbacks and do a lot of traversing, that's going to be a different story for adaptive writers. They know that. So the, the rating scale, what's that? We hit pause for a second. My, I have to go get my computer charger. I'm sorry. Oh, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> I want my computer to die in the middle of this. I'll be right back. Okay. Hey, everybody. It's just me and you right now. <laughs> oh, I have a bunch of messages. I got a lot to do. Welcome back. I was talking to everybody. You were talking to everybody. Thanks for yeah. keeping it going. Okay. You just never know how much juice you're going to need here. I always plug in before okay. meeting. Always. Oh, okay. So, I, oops, I so forgot to bring it. Oh, no worries. Okay, so the rating scale um, is uh, three levels. Um, AMTB stands for Adaptive Mountain Bike, and it's AMTB 1, 2, and 3. Um, so when it comes to the question, do you need a support rider? AMTB 1, no, you don't need a support rider. AMTB 3, yes, you need a support rider. AMTB 2, maybe? <laughs> and it really depends on that scale. Now, the rating system is um, is rated on a curve. Now, we want to serve the majority, the masses, right? The most people possible. So it's based on what most riders will experience on a trail, not all. And riders, um, 
in the extremities of the of the scale, the scale of rider um, disability, rider ability and equipment capability. Riders in those extremes know should know that they're in the extremes, and if they need to shift that scale one one notch or the other. For someone in the far left of the of the scale, you know something that's AMTB two might be AMTB three for them, and someone in the far right, you know this shit hot young paraplegic guy in a bowhead, he's gonna be able. To, whoop, I hit my computer. He's gonna he or she is gonna be able to ride a lot more, you know. So more stuff that is like AMTB three for everybody else might be AMTB two for them. Um, okay. Here is a trick question for you when it comes to that scale. Um, why can most riders in the left end of the spectrum ride more than riders in the in the right end of the spectrum? Why can typically the rider, let's maybe the quadriplegic rider with the front wheel drive bike, ride more trails than the shit hot paraplegic in a bowhead? Um, well, first of all, I, I was going to ask what, what a bowhead refers to. <laughs> oh, uh, bowhead is my number one competitor. <laughs> They're a really cool bike okay. uh, built in, uh, I think they're in, I can't remember where they're out of, but anyways, it angulates and is a lot narrower and smaller and powerful and can go a lot more places. Um, so that's. Well, you have, you have me stumped on that question though. I know. <laughs> the answer is <laughs> that far left spectrum rider is more often going to be with a support rider. Okay. Whereas the far right spectrum rider is going to be alone a lot more. Um, mm. And so what someone can ride with a support rider is a lot greater than without. That's the answer to the question. Um, so when it comes to scale, it's really interesting. It's based on a rider that's going to be alone. Um, and also operates, does not operate on its own uh, along with uncut video. And trail block. Um, the uncut video, so you can watch the bike go down the trail, and trail blog offers information on facilities, staging, things like that. Okay, so the scale, that one, two, three, that is based off of the concept that, or the context that you'll be alone as a writer. Yes. Yep. But uh, then you said that the number telling you if you need a rider with you, a support rider. Correct. Yeah. So, if you're going to ride an AMTB3 okay. trail, well, if you're going to, you need somebody with you. But if you're going to ride an AMTB2, AMTB2 trail, the, the phrase is support rider recommended. So AMTB1 is no support rider needed. Um, no obstacles exist, no support rider needed. AMTB2 is some obstacles exist, support rider recommended. AMTB3 is obstacles exist, support rider needed. Um, and remember the bl blanket rule, okay. never ride new single track alone for the first time. So everything that's AMTB2, first time you ride it, be with somebody, have a support rider. See if you can do it, mm -hmm. if it's no problem. And then some trails, just take practice. You know, it takes me a handful of times to ride, to get the line down, to figure things out. And then, you know, although it's a difficult trail, there might be a technical line or whatever, um, after a handful of, of times through, then I'm totally good riding it solo. But even then, trails change, you know? Uh, I've been in a situation where a trail I'm completely fine on, I'm riding alone, and, I, you know, maybe it's been... A, you know, a while since I've ridden it and I go down the trail and, oh shit, it's changed. Now I need help. So, you know, I, I've learned that if it's been a while, if it's been a couple months since you've ridden a trail, maybe take somebody just in case the trail has changed. And then we've mm -hmm. added, Great. I say we, I mean, I, cause it's pretty much a one man band over here. 
Um, I've added a, a few things to the rating system. Um, when it comes to the, the verbiage of what most writers will experience versus what all writers were exp will experience, um, I've added a little plus sign uh, that changes that verbiage. So, and that'll only apply to AMTB1. So something that's an AMTB1 plus means all riders, no matter what, will not need a support rider. It changes that word from most riders to all riders. And then I've added a little X, which means advanced features exist. This might be um, jumps, rock gardens, something technical, um, wood features. So, you know, a lot of jump lines are wide open. So they're AMTB1. You don't need a support rider but I'll add that X on there to identify that it's not a normal trail, you know, that advanced features do exist. So it's MTB one, don't need a support rider, but there's jumps. Does so, and it could be AMTB one plus. Yep. And an X. Uh, okay. Yeah, it could be an AMTB one plus X, which I've never done before. But usually if, if there's advanced features, not all yeah. riders are going to be good. I, you know, um, that's an interesting question. I've never even thought about that. There are some trails that are that way. Um, and because there's ride arounds, that's why. Might be AMTB one plus X um, because there's ride arounds on, on some of the features. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. That's a, at first, that's what I thought you were describing. <laughs> Yeah. And that, that's the that thing happen. too, because usually on a trail, you want to just like, what's the rule? Uh, scope it, lap it, own it. You know, you want to be able to roll through and check everything out first. You want to scope it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that's not an option for an adaptive rider when it comes to a berm with no flat area in the middle. You know, you can't just roll, ride that thing without speed. You know, I need speed to ride that. Um, and so being able to roll and scope stuff out is, is important. And so that's a part of a lot of work, um, that I'm doing, especially here in Bentonville is making it so, you know, these advanced, you know, these feature trails are all rollable. So an adaptive rider can scope it out first. Cause it's scary to jump into a trail and they're like, Oh, you have to keep speed. Like, you're like, well, fuck, I don't know what's coming up. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's yeah. super scary. <laughs> That's so sweet. Well, we're going to have to set up another call to talk about all the work you're doing at Bentonville. It's yeah, definitely. Um, and it'd be awesome. cool to do an, an article on it too, if that's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. Let's talk more and get an article in the works. And um, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm so stoked I had a chance to talk with you and that you were available. I I think I emailed like six different accounts trying to reach you. I got a bunch so, of different messages really... from you. That was cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, gotta reach him somehow. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for making the time and just having this long conversation, Jeremy. I really appreciate it. Awesome. I appreciate you. Thank you. It's been fun. Yeah. Um, well, I will. Just, uh, I'll send you the recording. Yeah, I'll send you a file request. Yeah, I'll send you a file request with Dropbox, and then if uh, you can just drop it in there. <laughs>